Today, I'll work with a world-renowned plasma physics professor to determine if it's possible to create a real-life lightning rifle, the Wonderwolf Digi-2 from Call of Duty Zombies. But how did we get here in the first place? Well, it's a journey that starts all the way back in 2009 with the release of World at War's DLC map, Shinonuma, and the introduction of arguably the coolest wonder weapon. For those who didn't grow up playing zombies, the formula is pretty straightforward. Zombies break through barriers and come after you. By killing zombies, you get points and progress through rounds. The higher you get, the stronger and faster the zombies get too. So basically, you just hold out as long as you can. Which is a lot of fun because it recreates that sort of arcade gaming experience, as everyone's given the same tools to start with. Then you choose what weapons, perks, and strategies can get you to the highest round. Every zombies game starts you off with a single pistol that basically does no damage, and your with either buying weapons from the wall with these outline chalk drawings, or you can test your luck and rely on the RNG of the mystery box. Spinning the mystery box gives you a random weapon that you can't typically purchase. And if you're lucky enough, you might get your hands on a specialty weapon, one that isn't supposed to exist in the real world. For the first two Zombies maps released, Noctar on Toten and Rooked, the available wonder weapon was all reliable, the ray gun, a space laser that would destroy your enemies with green donuts. However, on the third map, Shinonuma, a weapon that had infinite damage output was introduced, the Wonder Wolf Digi-2. The Wonder Wolf is a lightning rifle that allows you to kill an entire horde of zombies as lightning chains from one target to the next. No matter what round you're on, this will get the job done. It makes me think back to the days of how much fun it was playing split screen with my friends, and I would gloat that I had the best weapon in the entire game. Makes you embrace the dark side as if you're shooting lightning like the Emperor from Star Wars. This always made me wonder, would it be possible to create something like this? Fast forward about a decade after I graduate university with a master's in nuclear, plasma, and radiological engineering, and we find ourselves answering this question. And to do so, I'm collaborating with one of my favorite professors, David Rusick, who helms the channel Illinois Energy Prof. Professor Rusick covers a ton of interesting topics on his channel, from simple questions you might have about how things in the world work, to more complicated aspects of nuclear engineering. He's always had a great way of breaking down ideas, and is an inspiration for the type of content that I want want to make on this channel. I had focused my studies and research on nuclear power engineering, but because I wanted to get the most out of my degree, I've always endeavored to take classes in similarly related topics from radiological and plasma fields. Professor Ruzik is one of the leading minds in plasma processes and developments. Also, he's just a really great and interesting person, so I'm pleased to have him join me on this project. So without further ado, let's hear from an expert about what are plasmas and how they would work in this situation. Hello. I'm David Ruzik, Illinois Energy Prof. And I'm here today to tell you about whether you can shoot a lightning bolt across a room. Now this is clearly a fun topic and it grew out of a, a class I was teaching on you know, plasma engineering and plasma physics. And one of the students in there, graduate student, has a website. And his website looks at the science behind fun things in video and science fiction and video games. And in particular, we were interested in Call of Duty. There's a rifle that shoots plasmas and you can shoot zombies with it. And of course, we were wondering, and he was wondering, what it would really take to make that kind of gun. So, here is my gun. All right, I bought this uh, on the um, Amazon. <laughs> I buy everything. All right, and it is a Tesla coil in the circuit and it does need to be plugged in. And we'll come back to this in a bit. But the thing that it shoots is a plasma. And so I need to tell you what a plasma is. And a plasma is a hot ionized gas. So let's say we have a gas molecule and it has a nucleus, and it has electrons, more or less, going around it. And an ionized gas is where I put enough energy into this so that I have just the ion and I have just the electron, and they are free to move about. This is the fourth state of matter. You've got a solid, you warm it up like water. You warm it up, you get a liquid. You warm that up, you get a gas, fills the whole room. You uh, warm this up a bit more, and you can break apart the molecules and then break apart the atoms 
into charged particles. Because this one is negative and this one is positive, when I have a plasma, it doesn't fill up the whole room. It can kind of hold itself together because of those opposite charges. Now, a lot more about plasmas and lightning is on a video I'd made some years ago. So you can be able to follow up if you want more of this. But for right now, let's concentrate on plasma in the form of lightning. All right, so we have clouds. And again, a lot more details in that other video, but the clouds end up having a large charge, and so they are going to have a very high, many millions of volts charge on them. All right, megavolts of charge. And we have ground down here somewhere. All right, here is the ground. Now, you might think, boom, just ionizes all the air, making it a plasma. But that's not quite it. First, what happens is we have some kind of ionization, maybe cosmic rays comes, makes a few charges, and the cloud makes what's called a leader, a negative leader, right? And then this you may have another ionization cosmic ray event happen here, and it goes this way. And so this voltage that was in the cloud, right, is now transferred closer and closer and, and maybe closer and then closer. And when it gets very close to the ground, this voltage difference is now between the cloud, well, it's between this tip of the negative leader, you don't see anything yet, and the ground. And now you can actually have a positive leader come up, some type of positive charge strikes coming up, and at some point, crack, you get ionization. And since this was the charge channel, right, this is what lights up in the sky. And you can see on this picture more carefully, you can see some leaders that might not have uh, gone anywhere, right? They never reached all the way to the ground. Those will light up too because now the charge will all flow wherever there's an ionized gas channel. This lightning bolt is not something you want to be hit by. Part of my work with Professor Rusick involved a report on the analysis of electron density in thermal plasma devices. And I believe that these devices are where we can find our answer on how to make an actual lightning gun. Thermal plasma devices are those that operate under STP, standard temperature and pressure. These are your plasma cutters, welders, Tesla coils, and most relevant to this discussion, lightning bolts. But how can we generate lightning bolts for ourselves? Well, you're going to need a generator of sorts. The University of Illinois was always one of the best places to enjoy a Tesla coil concert, where the output voltages of coils were synced to music. But we're gonna go back a little further than college. If you've taken high school physics, you should have covered a device known as the Van de Graaff generator. This one device might hold the key to determining the plausibility of such a fantastical weapon. The Van de Graaff generator was developed by American physicist Robert J. Van de Graaff in the 1920s and was used to generate large voltages on its surface. Van de Graaffs are now commonly used to demonstrate the concept of static electricity, in which friction is used to tear electrons off of one surface and charge up another. This is done by rubbing a comb against a rubber belt and having that belt carry charges up the shaft until it discharges from the head. Science can be so dirty sometimes. But it's actually the unique shape of the Van de Graaff generator that allows it to build up such a large amount of charge at insanely high voltages on its surface. It basically comes down to how charges like to move. Charges like to gather on points of an object. This is why when there is a thunderstorm and the area around you becomes charged, it's recommended to avoid pointy objects like trees. That's because charge always builds up to take the path of least resistance when moving to the ground. So if you put your fingertips close to the sphere of the Van de Graaff, you'll notice that sparks of electricity will jump from the sphere. Now the charge is building up on you, and your hair will probably begin to stick up if you touch that surface. Van de Graaff generators have the potential to reach millions of volts. However, what limits their electrical output are corona discharges and the arcing phenomenon. Corona discharges occur when positive and negative ions recombine, and that's essentially what occurs when a lightning strike happens. Arcing is the prolonged breakdown of the neutral gases like air surrounding electricity. The 
smooth design of the generator makes it more difficult for current to flow and make those corona discharges, and arcing much more difficult. It also helps that this device operates at low currents, about 200 milliamps, so it doesn't cause any sort of damage other than a slight shock when you touch it. From an electrical discharge, current matters most when you're determining if something will kill you. So when determining if this device could work, we need to understand a few things. Does that technology fit the era and aesthetic of the weapon? What would be the effective range of such a device? How much power is required? And what is required of the person wielding it? The Wunderwaffe's name is derived from the German term for Wonder Weapon, because it does come from a World War II video game. The term Wonder Weapon was actually a propaganda push from the government, claiming the development of revolutionary superweapons that would stoke fear in their enemies and garner adorations from the civilian population. These superweapons included everything from the infamous V-2 rockets, specialty U-boats and aircraft, the 80 centimeter cannons mounted on railways, and even primitive night vision and infrared optics. The history of these wonder weapons is super interesting if you ever want to delve into it, and among the purported weapons were direct energy weapons. This is interesting because the DG from Wonderwolf Digi 2 comes from Die Glock, a theory about Nazi occultism that led to the research of free energy, anti-gravity, and time travel. Very fitting for the map Duris, the game's canonical birthplace of this device and the teleportation device. And if you look at the design of the Wonderwolf Digi 2, you notice the prongs sticking out at the end of the rifle. As I mentioned before, charges have difficulty flowing from smooth surfaces, but five pointy probes for a charge to flow from make it much more feasible. A discharge from the DG2 shoots a stream of lightning in one direction towards wherever it is aimed. Now the rifle derives all of its energy from three incandescent bulbs that are used as ammunition. Essentially one shot from the rifle corresponds to one bulb of power being used up. While the history of thermal plasma devices hasn't really changed since World War II, the specific wattage of the bulbs can be determined after the energy and electron density of each lightning shot is found. And Professor Ruzik knows just how to do that. No, it wasn't that cool. So, we've got a gun, and uh, we know what it's made of, plasma, and how to get it there. But will it jump from zombie to zombie? Probably not. But it could if the first zombie wasn't grounded and then the next zombie along the line was grounded. You see, here's a great example. This guy, he's got a uh, metal rod in one hand and a metal rod in the other and the lightning bolt looks like it goes through him and then eventually to this big cage out here which is grounded. I'm sure this guy has a nice thick wire under his shirt going between those two, um, because otherwise he'd be dead. <laughs> you don't want to get hit by a lightning bolt. Uh, but that's a perfect example that we can go from something to something else if they're both grounded. But, but of course, you also have to have enough power. So let's do a little math. How much power do you need? A lot. 11 kilowatts if you want to go about 10 feet, 3 meters, uh, and that will give you the voltage at the tip at about half a megavolt. You want to go 30 feet, about 9, 10 meters, you're going to need 25 kilowatts of power, and um, that'll probably get you at a megavolt. All right? It's a lot. It's a lot. The key, of course, is how long do you want to stay on? Because remember, um, power equals energy over time. So if you want a 25 kilowatt powered blast to last for one second, you need 25 kilojoules, the unit of energy. And this means you'd have to store it, especially if you don't want your gun plugged into the wall. Um, if I want, say, a 10 second uh, burst, that will go 30 feet, multiply by 10, and we need 250 kilojoules of a voltage source that can discharge extremely completely in those 10 seconds. I have one of those in my lab. I have this capacitor bank, and 
Notice it, it's a long capacitor to bank. It goes all the way down to there and from the floor to the ceiling. And all that fully charged is your 250 kilojoules. Probably not a little tiny bulb you can stick into the side of a machine. And that's what you need to know about shooting lightning across a room. One of my childhood dreams has come true, and now I know exactly what I need to build a lightning rifle. <laughs> if only the BATF would allow me to do so. Oh well. I sincerely want to thank Professor Ruzik for helping me with this project. It was a joy to be part of his class and learning from him. And if you want that college feeling, please subscribe to Illinois Energy Prof for more lessons about everything. Leave a like on this video, and if you want me to cover more science behind things from my childhood, I will certainly do so. Have a beautiful doing, and I'll see you all next time.